to another FinPath University course. This is Matt Escalante, Certified Financial Planner Professional and Senior Director of Institutional Investment Services at TCG. I'll be your host today for this month's FinPath University course. For this course, uh, we'll be addressing some retirement plan investments. What I want to have everybody walk away with is, you know, as you're you know, choosing which retirement plan you want to be a part of is the next choice is trying to figure out you know, your underlying investments. And your underlying investments should be a result of your overall risk tolerance, uh, your overall time horizon. So giving you some ideas that you should walk through and helpful information uh, so you can make better choices about your investments inside of your group retirement plan. I know that sometimes it can be complicated. Um, there's different slang terms or jargon that's used in the financial services world that can be complicated. So my hope for this course is to um, share a little bit more information about uh, those terms, what they mean, to help guide you to make better choices along the way. Um, so you're choosing appropriate investments for your for your risk tolerance and time horizon, and how your overall allocation of your money to your investments plays a huge part in um, expected returns. So some of the topics for discussion today are different types of asset classes that we should be looking at uh, through our overall investment lineup. Um, asset allocation, so basically designing a mix of investments from different asset classes. You know, diversification. So you know, one of the easiest ways to uh, c- to create a portfolio that is going to kind of stand the test of time and weather different types of market environments is by creating a well diversified portfolio, a uh, mixture of different asset classes, different um, stocks and bonds, and so forth. Uh, so making sure that that's on point. Um, next is we're portfolio rebalancing, and by rebalancing our portfolio, and you know, what we're doing is we're making sure we're staying within our our prescribed risk tolerance as the market tends to fluctuate and move. And then we'll cover some investment types that are common to group retirement plans along the way. So common vehicles for retirement plans uh, really come in two different forms. You know, one is going to be your employer sponsored plans. So depending on who your employer is, that could be a four hundred one k in the corporate world could be a 403B or 457 if you're a school district employee or government employee. Um, and for, for 2020, the calendar year 2020, the contribution limits have changed. They've actually increased, giving us more room to save into one of these plans. So if you're under the age of 50, you can contribute up to 19500 If you're over 50, you can contribute up to $26,000 into one of these employer-sponsored plans. So a lot of room to save. Another vehicle you have available to you is the individual retirement account or an IRA. Um, you know, the I in IRA stands for obviously individual, which means it's not tied to your employer. You're, you're free to go choose at your bank, at other financial institutions, you know, Charles Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity, a TD Ameritrade to open up a, an IRA account. Um, the contribution limits are a little bit less or a little bit lower for 2020. Um, where you, if you're under 50, you can contribute up to 6,000. If you're over 50, you can contribute up to $7,000. And then of course, when we're making our contributions to either one of these plans, we want to be making the decision of, do we want to, um, if we have an employer sponsored plan, we have the option to make contributions on a pre-tax basis. Uh, the advantage there on uh, pre-tax contributions is anytime that we make that contribution, we reduce our taxable income in the year we make that contribution. Then on the flip side, we have the in both uh, in most employer sponsored plans and to and generally all IRAs uh, give you the option for Roth, uh, which has the benefit of tax free distributions down the road, which is a positive thing. So first, we should start by addressing you know what are the major asset classes that we have to to invest in. And again, we can get more granular here, but you know it's important to focus on these these major broad asset classes. Uh, to get us dialed in, and these are these are more common in group retirement plans that have um, maybe fewer investment options. Tend to focus around these major asset classes. So on the the equity side, and we when we say equity, we're thinking of stocks. You know, those fall under the list we see on the left side of the screen. When we talk about domestic, we're talking about companies that are you know generally domiciled here in the U.S. So domestic is domestic to us in the United States. International develop are going to be you know larger companies um, that, are, that are domiciled in you know large developed countries such as your 
uh, France and Germany, um, you know, a lot of the, the European countries and so forth, your Canada and so forth. Those are going to be large developed international um, countries with companies that are domiciled there. Your emerging markets are generally going to be um, a little bit smaller. Uh, your countries like your Brazils and Indias and so forth that are domicile, domiciling uh, companies that are you know part of that emerging markets. And generally those com- those markets are emerging with a desire to become international developed um, markets. Next, we have commodities. Commodities falls under the area of, of um, precious metals, whether it's silver or gold or agricultural goods such as wheat or and uh, cattle and so forth. So commodities tend to be in a group retirement plan pretty much bundled together. There's not many times that you find them kind of isolated uh, as, as individual sections. Uh, real estate and then sectors are, are other areas that we might find within a, a group retirement plan. On the, on the fixed income side, on the right, we're looking at bonds. And generally, bonds are broken down into uh, three different categories. You know, corporate bonds, so debt issued by a corporation. Uh, municipal bonds, which would be debt issued by some kind of government agency. And then treasury, uh, which are you know, obviously coming from the, from the U.S. government. And then probably one of the most conservative uh, investments that we, we can have along the way is putting money into a, a money market, which is probably one of the areas of the, the least risk but also going to be you know, the expectation of probably the, the lowest return as well, since we're taking very, very little risk. <laughs> when we're looking at different types of um, equities, which kind of on the stock side, is oftentimes we break down you know, these companies inside of a mutual fund by whether they are you know, large cap, mid cap, or small cap. So that's basically terminology that we're using to reference the the market capitalization of you know the companies inside of that that given mutual fund. Uh, so basically, what mar- market capitalization is is the total mar- do- dollar market value of a company's outstanding shares of stock. So I have an example here of if a company has a million shares priced at excuse me ten million shares priced at a hundred dollars, then the market cap of that company is going to be a billion dollars. Uh, the way that we break down market capitalization is in these categories listed below. Um, generally, companies with a uh, that are considered to be in the large market cap group are $10 billion and above in market cap. Mid cap group is going to be $2 billion to $10 billion, and then small cap is going to be anything less than, than $2 billion. In addition to market capitalization, we're also looking at mutual fund categories of growth, value, and blend. When we're looking at a growth-focused fund, we're generally understanding that the fund's going to be invested in companies focused on their earnings. So um, they tend to be higher priced than the broader market due to their strong earnings. So you would be paying a little bit more of a premium for the uh, individual stocks inside of a growth-focused fund Uh, because you would expect to have strong earnings year after year. So these are going to be your larger, more established uh, companies like a a Coca-Cola or a a Home Depot, basically your your blue chip companies. Value, on the other hand, is focused a little bit different. Basically, the value-focused investment is going to be looking at lower price than the broader broader market and a potential for a rebound. So the, the manager inside of a, a value fund is going to be saying, I think that this is a really strong uh, company that we should be invested in inside of the fund, but I also think it's undervalued in terms of its overall um, price, and we expect it to have a jump up in the, in the future. Now, we can't always determine whether it's appropriate in a given time to, to be in either growth or value, so you do have blend options that will be allocated to both growth and value. Um, and so you don't have to make that individual decision. Here's an example of a mutual fund. Um, I pulled this information from a, from a Morningstar report. Um, this mutual fund that we're looking at is the Vanguard 500 Index. Uh, it's an admiral share class brought to us by Vanguard. Um, pretty popular fund we see in a lot of different group retirement plans. Based off the information about the portfolio listed here below, on the left-hand side under the asset allocation section, we can see that 
the majority of the assets, 98.70%, are in the U.S. So we know that this is a domestic U.S.-focused mutual fund. When we look over to the right, we can see in, within the grid that the majority of the investment is in large companies focused in both growth and blend and value. So generally across the board, given this information, we know that if we were picking the Vanguard 500 uh, index, the Admiral share class, that we would be focusing on a, a mutual fund that is, is concentrated with U.S. companies and a blend of both growth and value. In comparison, we have an example with this DFA US small cap value one. Uh, with this one, we can see down on the bottom on the left-hand side, the asset allocation again is to the US and it's implied in the name as well with 96.6% uh, of the investment in US equities. But as we look over to the weighting on the right, uh, we can see as the name implies that the majority of the investments are held in the, in the small cap space but there's obviously a tilt uh, towards value. Um, so we, we understand that if we're looking at this fund, we're going to be investing in U.S. small companies with a value focus. So when it comes to designing an overall portfolio, knowing the information that we have about uh, different types of you know, equities versus fixed income, the information that we have about uh, different market cap, large, mid, and small, and the information that we now have about growth versus value and even blend options that are available to us. When we start to put that together is where we develop our overall you know, asset allocation, is how are we allocating our money to a, uh, a an investment um, selection. When we're looking at the um, different asset classes and the different market caps and so forth, you know, it's tough to know is, you know, which one of these are more aggressive, which one of these are more conservative. And this graph really helps us to, to understand that. So generally looking at the left-hand side, starting with cash equivalents and so forth, we can, we know that that's generally going to be a lower risk investment option. But as we move further and further to the right, all the way over to small cap stocks, we know that's going to be a generally a more high risk investment option. So if we're looking at our overall investment allocation inside of our retirement account, the more weight or the more overall dollars we have allocated to the left-hand side of this means we're going to have a more conservative portfolio. But as we have more and more investments allocated to the right-hand side of this, your mid-cap stocks, your international stocks, your small-cap stocks, is you're generally going to have a more uh, aggressive um, risk tolerance and a more aggressive portfolio. So here are some portfolio model examples that we can draw on and kind of apply the information that we've learned so far. Just understand that your portfolio's, portfolio's overall risk profile is based on your allocation to each asset class. So if we start at the top here, we can see this is a more conservative investment allocation. And we know it's more conservative because it's got you know, 50% of fixed income, it's got 30% in cash. So it's about 80% on the fixed income on the bond side and only about 20% on the, on the equity side or the stock side. So that is um, generally going to be a more conservative portfolio. As we move down to moderate and then down into the aggressive allocation, we can see that switches where on the aggressive allocation, we have 50% in large companies. We have 20% in small companies, 25% in inter international equity. So in the aggressive side, we have 95% of our money allocated to um, different asset classes of stocks and only 5% in a cons more conservative investment on the cash investment side. Rebalancing is an important thing to be doing inside of your retirement account. Uh, from the standpoint of, you know, we may choose a specific investment allocation that fits our risk tolerance. So for example, maybe I'm right in the middle where I'm half stocks and I'm half bonds. But over the course of, let's say a given year, is stocks can go up and bonds can go down. And at that point, my investments are actually going to be um, outside of my risk tolerance, right? 
if stocks went up and bonds went down, now I have more investments in stocks than I do in bonds. And I generally have a more aggressive portfolio than I, I initially set. So rebalancing is the process of setting back to what our initial risk tolerance or initial invest asset allocation was. So for example, if my stocks were initially at 50% and my bonds were at 50%, but during the course of the year, my uh, the stocks went up, now it's 60% of my portfolio and my bonds are only 40%, I've become more aggressive. So rebalancing would be moving the 60% back to 50% and the 40% back up to 50% to get back into the risk tolerance I prescribed. Now, we can do that in a couple ways. One is just off a timetable. Some some folks choose to do it monthly. Some do it quarterly. Some folks do it annually. Um, that's definitely an option that folks can, um, can choose. The other thing that you can do is to make a, a constant mix strategy with corridors. So let's just say, for example, I have listed here if my my large cap exposure target was 25% of my overall overall allocation, and I gave myself a corridor of plus or minus 5%, meaning I was okay with it going down to 20, but I was also okay with it going up to 30, and it fell outside of that range, that's when I would rebalance my portfolio to get back to the target of 25%. Inside of the FinPath platform, there is a very useful tool for you to use to understand what your risk tolerance is. If you go into the Wellness Score Analyzer and you click on Assessments, you will find a risk tolerance assessment available to you inside of the FinPath platform. Uh, you will very easily and very quickly be able to answer uh, 11 questions. The questions are then going to aggregate a score that will present to you an ideal investment portfolio for you. So in my example, as you see on the screen, after answering the questions, I was recommended a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. I can then take that information, look at my group retirement plan or my IRA, and choose investments that would closely match this recommended investment allocation. Thank you for joining me today for this FinPath University course. If you need support with anything related to your personal finances, please visit our website at finpathwellness.com, where you'll have access to resources, tools, and coaching support. Please join us next time.